Hi, everyone. This is Raquel. Hi, and this is Jennifer. Welcome to Madness Cafe. This is a feminist podcast where we talk about women's issues, politics, and health and wellness. And where those issues intersect. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Madness Cafe. Today, Jennifer and I are joined by a very special guest. Her name is Lala Drona. She is a Venezuelan-American painter and video artist born in Denver, Colorado. After receiving a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Colorado, Lala Drona has since published and exhibited her work internationally. Most recently, her videos and paintings exploring digital spaces and the female gaze were shown at the Cité des Arts de Paris. Hopefully I said that okay. (laughs) Her paintings, videos, and writing explore women in the digital world and alternate realities. The totality of her artwork contributes to and exists within a fictional universe and mythology established online and then recontextualized in the physical world through paint on canvas, performance, and sculpture. She is based in Paris, France. Lala, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm really glad glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yay. So I just want to jump right in and ask you to tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. So as you were saying before, I'm a, I'm an artist and I've been an artist my whole life. I grew up just always painting. And my mom told me that as soon as I could hold a paintbrush or a pencil, I was, you know, creating. And so that's something that's always been inside me, but it was around when I was, let's say 11 to 12 to 15, that I think I really dived into my art and the reason was is because during that time of puberty and bodies developing, things growing, things not growing, I actually had something called a unilateral breast agenesis and that means that one breast grew into a full C cup by the time I was 15 years old Mm -hmm. and the other breast did not grow at all so it didn't develop and so from the time I was 11 like to 15 years old, I held, I kept that secret from everyone, from my mother, from everyone. And uh, I was so ashamed of it. And I was just hoping that the, the other breast would, would catch up and, and grow. And, and so I think that that probably did a lot of damage in itself, but it also made me very sensitive, I think, to women's roles and the treatment of women and our bodies. I was hyper aware of everything that was going on just because I was afraid of that secret coming out. So that has really contributed to my art. I kept that secret until I, I had my first surgery. I told my mom about it. She, she helped me talk to the doctor and we decided to get a reconstructive surgery on the un- undeveloped side. So I had a, a breast augmentation. So a a breast implant put in on that side. And from there, I lived with the breast implant. I still didn't tell anyone except for just a few people here and there. Then I, around 23, 24 years old, I moved to Paris and it was time for me to just really come out with that secret and stop being so ashamed of my body. And I did a, a series of paintings where I, I looked at myself in the mirror And I I painted myself over and over again, nude, just to see my breasts and see the breasts, not just as breasts, but as uh, these objects or as colors. And I really started to get distance from them. I had an exhibition and came out about all of it. And it was a really beautiful experience. Yeah, from there, I've, I've just continued to create art and continue to talk about topics in women in the digital world through art. Wow. What an inspiring story. I, Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Same. I mean, the, the fact that you describe the experience of sharing your secret and unburdening yourself from that and letting go of that shame as a beautiful experience. I mean, that, that really stood out to me. Jennifer and I have talked about body image on the show several times just in a specific episode sure and then you know it kind of comes up in in different ways in different episodes so to hear you talk about sharing a part of your body so publicly as a beautiful experience is very awe-inspiring to me I can't (laughs) I can't imagine ever doing that so my hat is off to you for that 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a um, it was a really beautiful experience, and um, it was also beautiful because other people began to talk to me about their bodies, and so that was that was also really beautiful to make that connection with people and to sort of normalize our bodies and the differences between them and to realize these are the things that make us beautiful too. What do you feel happened to your shame during that process of unveiling? Um, the shame, I guess what happened to it, it, it kind of disappeared. I would say it disappeared. And I think there was a little bit of guilt though, as well after, yeah. um, because I felt like, wow, I created this cage around myself that I didn't necessarily need to. I was just afraid mm -hmm. and needed protection. And so I did feel a little guilty of, of maybe doing that to myself in some way, but happy that I was freed. In your work, you have talked about the void. Can you describe what the void is to you? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, I guess the next part of the story. Uh, so after I had the breast implant, um, things did get better, but I did feel like, you know, no matter what, having a, a foreign object in your body, you, and maybe not on the other side, it was imbalanced because I had the natural breast and the, the implant and it, it almost felt like Tupperware or something like it, it just wasn't very comfortable. And so I was constantly protecting it. And I, after about, I think 10 years, you're supposed to get the implant, um, like changed or replaced so that you can avoid toxicity. And so it was, I think 17 years later, I went to the doctor, mm -hmm. um, cause I just have been avoiding it. I didn't want to do another surgery and, yeah. uh, yeah, she, the doctor told me that they could remove it um, or they could replace it, but she also wanted to replace the natural side with an implant because she thought that this way there, it would be um, more symmetric mm. or like symmetrical. And um, so I just, I didn't even want the first implant really. And it just got me thinking like, is this my life? Every 10 years I have to, you know, kind of take care of my breasts. Um, it was just very, yeah, it was very difficult. And I decided to sit down and, and think of maybe other options. And I thought, okay, what is one way I can avoid all surgeries in the future and be healthy? And I thought, well, if they can remove my natural breast, why don't they just remove the implant from my, un my undeveloped side and also remove my, my real breast as well? And so mm -hmm. I decided to begin the surgeries of removing everything. I just had a surgery in... February, last February this year, to remove the implant. And the next surgery will be to remove the, the natural breast. And so to answer your question about the void. So after 17 years of having my breast covered with this implant, it's the first time that I'm removing the implant and being uh, confronted with the void or the lack that I have been, I guess, hiding from for so long. And so I wanted to really approach it with my art. And so I, I really began to stare at the void. And that means I started painting voids and getting closer with every painting. Um, every painting you get closer and the void gets bigger until finally I'm entering the void. And then we find out what's inside the void. So what's inside the void? Well, right now I'm, <laughs> I think it's just, there's, it's going to be a, like kind of a magical fictional world of like nymphs and like a digital kind of world type of thing, but it's gonna be something a little bit more, it's dark, but fun, I think. Okay. Well, yeah. and it's something of your creation, right? So it's it's like you're taking, you're taking your power back. And that's something that you talk a little bit about, in, well, not a little, but you, you reference that in your, in your art and in your writing about feminine power in the female gaze. Can you talk a little bit more um, about the feminine power and feminine in, in the female gaze? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to say there. I think the female gaze, um, it comes from the idea of the, the male gaze that, mm -hmm. you know, we see the world through uh, male eyes because a lot of uh, artists or photographers and directors mm -hmm. in the past have been, have shown through their lens or how they see the world. And so the female gaze is, is this question of what would, world, what would the world look like or how would we depict the world through women's eyes? And I think there's lots of ways of doing this. Uh, some people believe that, okay, even men could, 
could uh, portray the female gaze. Maybe it's just a stylistic thing. Um, but with me, I think it's there. It's hard to explain. I haven't. I also haven't thought about this for a while. But I think it's things. Are, I think there's a voyeuristic aspect a lot of times mm -hmm. with the male gaze and sure. with the female gaze. There's more of uh, details and sensuality and yeah i guess we're we're definitely more the it's not necessarily being the subject but being mm. the the player like the the main character that's driving right. the story yes as well. right right yeah. being, being part of the experience as opposed to just sort of standing outside and mm -hmm. observing mm -hmm. exactly and so that's why you know a lot of times women are portrayed in art as they are the subjects. And so with my work with the female gaze, I was, I depicted once in a painting, a, an empty room mm -hmm. and where the woman is supposed to be as a, as a model or a subject, but instead I, I created the frame as a female body. So it's, I guess, quite literally oh, wow. looking through, I guess, women where we're, and trying to give that, that feeling uh, to to the spectator like okay this is an empty room and when you see an empty room you want it to be filled well women we feel like we should always be on stage we should always be um, almost we are the entertainment for the the male gaze or all those things and I think I was somehow trying to give that that impression to the to the viewer like mm -hmm. you should fill this room wow I like that like the um yeah like you should be in this room you know, this room is for you, that you, you fill this room with what you want to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. I like that very much. In your work, you also talk about alternate realities. I'm super interested in that because both of my young daughters are artists. They do a different type of work, but the youngest is really kind of studying and drawing her own alternate realities right now. But I'm curious as to someone with a little bit more experience, what is what does that represent and what does it mean to you? I think it's absolute freedom. Um, there's so many, you know, especially growing up, there's so many rules. There's so many things already decided for us. And I think it's very, you know, we, we feel the pressure. We feel like we can't be free. And that's one way to be free is to just create your own world. And I think, at least for me, something I realized from a young age is that there are many decisions made, but if there's a decision already made, that means that, you know, there was a moment where people made that decision. And that also means the decision can be unmade. So, and, and also going through that breast experience, no doctors really knew what to do or the right thing to do. So sure. I kind of realized too, from that young age to that nobody really knows what they're doing, but, but everybody's trying, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're all trying. And so to get back to your question, um, the, yeah, uh, your own fictional universe is just complete freedom and it's a playground. It's, it's a playground where you can experiment. And, you know, for me, it was experimenting with different uh, medium, with paint, with photography, with drawing inside that, that cohesive universe. So it was, it's a, it's a great, great place. And in your alternate reality, you, La Ladrona, you're the star. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There, it's true. Um, so it's, uh, so that's on uh, my alternate reality is, is yes, it's on based on a fact is where I started it. It's a, a blog and I write these mock articles of, about La Ladrona, who is this famous artist um, that the paparazzi is after. But the thing is, is uh, it's very, you know, it's in a fictional world. So um, this artist, La Ladrona, she runs an art laboratory. And in that art laboratory, her and her, assist her, and her assistants, they do experiments on muses in order to extract inspiration from them for her, her paintings. So for me, it's, it's sort of this uh, uh, metaphor for the creative process inside my brain. But it's been a really fun universe for me because muses, you know, they protest and they, they fight for their rights and, you know, there's muse abuse going on and they're trying to get the special types of inspiration from them. So they're being abused and they're fighting back. And um, yeah. And so for me, the whole, I think the whole famous part was when I was, because I started this maybe 11 years ago. 
I think I was very influenced by my culture in the way of thinking that success is always linked to fame yeah. and being an artist, like that's just not the, the artist's journey. Even receiving recognition is not the same as, as being famous. So it started as this, uh, okay, maybe, you know, this is what I should be. So let's write it as if it's true. And then later it turned into more of a social critique, I think on that. Oh my gosh. I think it's so important because I have, like I said, two young artists in the home and what they see is everything on social media, TikTok, Instagram. And I, I'm guilty of that myself too, because I play in that world. But I think, you know, in the world of the past, everyone thought they were going to be an actress or maybe they were going to be a football star. And now it's, I'm going to be a TikTok star. Or I'm going to mm -hmm. be a YouTube and that isn't necessarily their art. That's, it, it's an outlet, but it's not necessarily the reason for creation of art. Exactly. I was thinking about this actually today. So it's interesting that you brought that up. I have been thinking about how I was lucky to not have social media until, I don't know, 20, my 20s or something, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit before, but lucky. Um, <laughs> yeah, very sure. lucky because that meant that my art was mine. I wasn't making art and showing the whole world. I had a long, you know, I had a great gestation period of really just creating stuff for myself and showing my close friends maybe or not and, and letting myself grow, which I think is really, really hard today to do. Yeah, it, it, it seems like you, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, and Jennifer, you touched on a little bit as well, of using your art to make sense of the world and to critique the world, given everything that goes on and the craziness in the world today, and just even just things that are going on within ourselves, to have art as a way to make sense of that and to figure things out, that's pretty amazing. And the fact that you can put these things on paper or on video or on canvas is pretty amazing, especially having started when you were so young and then making sense of everything that was going on, you know, with your body and growing up and, and all that. So I, I like that that's something that you focus on, that you, you are using this to make sense of the world and create a world that you want to see. And self, and self, make yeah. sense of self. Yeah. Yeah, it's hugely powerful because you can, I think also, it was liberating to create my own artistic personality and eventually become her in some way uh, because I don't know, we're, we're born into these identities too of who our community thinks we should be. Mm. And, it, and it's very difficult sometimes to grow, especially if you're, you're gonna stay and you're not moving anywhere. So it does give you a place to grow and, and interpret and understand the world. I, I really think that art saved my life for sure, for sure. Mm. Mm, that's powerful. So on your Instagram recently, I noticed that you did a little campaign about filming yourself naked. And this is something that I've been delving into a little bit. Raquel doesn't know this, but uh, <laughs> I have a project. Eventually I'm going to do some naked yoga in the woods and film it. But how, how did you decide to do that? How did it feel? Oh, it was amazing. What did I, I can't remember. Let me think of what the, why I started doing it. Oh, because it started because actually it was before my surgery and I wanted to get images of my body naked before it changed and just to document it. And I, it, so it happened that way where I just filled my, filmed myself naked and I walked into the camera frame, then walked back out and, you know, very simple, nothing. Um, and then I looked at the, I looked back at the film just to take a look on it, to, to take a look at it. And it was on the camera kind of preview on the digital camera. Right. And so that it was a screen. And so I looked at the image on the screen and the first ideas and thoughts that came into my head were pornography, but not the type of pornography that's just, I don't know, soft sex and very, mm. you know, nice, I guess, but it was like the receiver of violence type of pornography. Mm. And I, it was also a feeling of, I felt bad for this girl. 
and like, oh, that poor thing or something. And, and, you know, it, it just shocked me because I said, I, I was having these thoughts come up in my head and I thought, wait, that's me. And there's no violence. There's, it's just me alone. Why am I attributing all of these identities and these thoughts to my own body? And I, I realized, okay, it's, it's also the, maybe the context in which I'm seeing my image. So it's the screen. And I thought, okay, the screen, wh how, when do I see women's bodies on screen? And of course we see pop-ups all the time. We see uh, that's, we have, a, we see women's bodies as these receivers of sex and um, sometimes violence and things like that. So it was really powerful for me because I also realized my own thoughts and maybe biases and connections to seeing the naked female form. And it made me realize that we need, <laughs> maybe we need to see uh, our, our bodies in other context outside of sex and violence and danger right yeah so and maybe we've also internalized the male gaze so we can't even see ourselves initially through our own female gaze because of the dominance of the male gaze mm -hmm. yeah it's so interesting to me that you saw that because when i think about doing this experience myself I think of doing it for more of a body acceptance. Like I'll, t I'll tell you guys a secret. I did film myself naked in the woods, taking a shower very quickly, nice. just a couple pictures, right? When I looked at myself for the first time, I went directly to all those pieces of me that I don't like, like directly to it. I didn't see violence or any of that. Of course, it wasn't on the same type of screen that you were looking at. So that may have had a difference but I just nitpicked myself and then I stopped. I'm like, okay, wait, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing here. But I think it's interesting, your experience, it's almost like you weren't actually even seeing yourself in a way. Yeah, I wasn't. And I was totally focused on myself. So that's so interesting that there was such a difference. How did it feel after you processed your feelings around it? I think it, I felt uh, maybe a little bit betrayed by society in a way, because this is, it just brought me back to how I grew up uh, being very young, you know, 12, from 12 years old, I was constantly seeing pornography on online in, in this very hardcore way, I think, or friends, you know, joking around and showing, or um, it's just been very prevalent growing up, I think with the internet. And I think it's even worse today uh, with smartphones and it's, it's really scary. You know, I, I think I felt slightly betrayed by yeah my upbringing but also i felt very happy again and liberated again uh just to think and also it made me feel more emboldened to to do more art nude as well and to to provide maybe some some more context for people of of a of a female figure and maybe a, a non uh, convent like an unconventional female figure um you know, in, in the nude form outside of violence and, and whatnot. And it also helped me appreciate artists who do that even more. Yeah, me too. I agree. You say you have an exploration with the dark and the deep. What is that about? Yeah, I, I think that dark and deep is, it's, you know, it's unexplored. And I think it's the most exciting to me. And I also think that there's beauty in darkness. Maybe it's, I spent so much time in it that I got comfortable there, but you can, you can find beautiful things in, in darkness, I think. And the deeper you go, um, of course, a lot of people feel uncomfortable, but for me, that's always been sort of a rule for me. If I feel, I need to feel uncomfortable. I need to feel like I'm pushing boundaries. I need to, with my art, I mean, and I need to, if I'm too comfortable, then I'm not learning, I'm not growing. And I think the darkness or these, these realms of, of maybe even some suffering, I think a lot of people have a hard time um, staring at them and, and looking at them for a long time. And I think, well, if I'm able to, why not be one of those people who can give voice or, or try to, because I know that it's hard for some people to spend so much time there. So what is the beauty that you see there? 
the beauty I see there, um, I think creativity. So yeah, there's there's scary, like for example, horror films, you know, I'm, I'm really happy people make horror films. I love horror films. They're very dark, you know, they can, they can be very dark, but there's so much creativity there. If you think about it, horror films are the most creative as far as music, as far as camera angles, as far as makeup, you just have a huge potential for creation there. And so it's, right. I, yeah. That's interesting. I don't think I'll ever look at a horror film the same way again. I'm one of those people who doesn't like them. I'm a very uncomfortable with a horror film. They are scary. And of course, if you're having a stressful day, you probably don't want to watch a horror film at the end of the day, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it could help. Maybe it could be cathartic. <laughs> yeah. In your heart, what do you think getting the breast implant and then removing the breast implant, what do you think both of those things truly inspired in you? So I think just at a, at a base, there's this idea that a lot of people say, which is artists create from a lack. And I mean, I had a literal physical lack, but I also had a lack even before the breast, I think I had. So I, my mom's from Venezuela and my dad's from the United States. And I grew up not at first, I, I couldn't really speak Spanish very well and I couldn't speak English very well either. So it was actually quite hard to communicate when I got to school. And um, I think so I was quite, I was quiet and doing art was just another way for me to express and, and yeah. And so I think as far as what the, the breast implant did was it, I don't know if it, I think it helped me feel more confident for sure, but it was more of a crutch. And for my art, it just, I think it made me not really be able to paint or or create things outside of the breast implant or breasts for a very long time I was very breast centric in my art I still am in the shapes and and whatnot getting it out I think has liberated me from some of these I'll still stay around the same topics but I think the imagery I feel for some reason I feel like I'm I'm able to create more images than just breasts or be inspired by breasts and and things like that so I think there's a, a liberation coming. Of course, it's only been a few months still, so waiting to see what's going to happen. So it seems like your art has been a way for you to process what goes on for you internally and to, and also what's going on externally, but how you're actually feeling about these things and processing these feelings so that it's almost, it's like these are the real world applications of what are going on for you mentally and emotionally and, and physically. Does that, mm -hmm. is that, is that fair to say? I think it's very fair to say. I think that's exactly what's happening. And I also feel like it's, I try to open myself up to the muses as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if I'm feeling these emotions and, and all of that, maybe it's not even me, maybe it's, it's, it's also some sort of muse or, and, and I'm not going to try to judge it too much. At the beginning, I did judge a lot that, oh, what I make is too dark or uh, why does everyone think my art is so dark? And because people really tell me all the time, like, oh, I don't, it makes me uncomfortable or, and it, you know, when you're younger, you want to make people feel more comfortable. <laughs> so, but as an artist, you outgrew that, the need to make people feel comfortable. I think that's another Another thing I'd like to impart to my children. Yeah, I think through my art and sticking to it and being very passionate about it as my number one, putting it as my number one priority, that also helped me be a strong person and also, yeah, helped me have a lot more confidence and because it was something that was just mine, you know, nobody could take that away from me. I could, you know, have a, a breakup with a, with a, with a partner and it doesn't matter. I have my art. Has the reaction from other people changed as well? Yeah. So there's a big, there's a, a, a strange phase in artists when you're young, where you're, we you start to question, okay, when I introduce myself, should I call myself an artist or should I not? I'm not working full time as an artist. So am I an artist? And, you know, so when I was younger, I would say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm an artist. And they, some people would, a lot of people would other young people would say, oh, do you make money doing it? And 
I would, you know, say no, but I think now, look, nobody says that to me anymore, but if I think now I realize, oh, that's just the world's perception of what an artist is. Mm -hmm. And it's very sad that we live in a world that we only value or can give somebody an identity if they make money or are validated by a financial system. And that's not what it's about. Being an artist is more like a religion in a way or a spirituality. And so now I explain to people, okay, yeah, but when you go to church, do you get paid? (laughs) You know, or when you... When you pray, do you get paid? And no, they don't. Okay, then why would you go to church if you don't get paid? Like, it's a different thing. Yeah, I love that. I think it's all the throes of capitalism. We talk about that a lot in this house with with the artist children. Uh, the, The drive to make money, produce, produce, produce. And and also, if you get in that mindset, it can rob you of the joy of your creativity in the first place. Exactly. And and social media does that too, to be honest. I, I constantly have to keep myself in check because I'll start to notice, oh, I need, to, I feel pressure because I feel like I need to make a painting so that I can post something new. Make content. Content. You have to keep putting content up on social media. That's their rules. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And they're not human, those rules. It's, it's an algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not even human inspired really so it's to keep ourselves up to that standard and that rhythm is is so unhealthy and that's why there's so many mental health issues as well and so yeah I'm, I'm constantly having to put myself or keep myself in check with okay remember why you're doing art is it for let's say you you don't make any any money and let's imagine that you um you don't even like social media is gone would you still make art The answer is yes. So do it at your own rhythm and how you want to, because it's the only thing that's really yours. Yeah, that's amazing. I hope somebody listening to this hears that and actually takes that in, that you're doing what you love. It doesn't have to be for consumption by other people. It doesn't have to be a career. It doesn't have to be a moneymaker. It can be, this is something you love and you're, this is an expression of your love. What's going on inside you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And a lot of times we don't really have control of the rest of it and it's really just sticking to it and doing it every day and working and, you know, never letting you it go. That can sometimes put you around communities of other people like that, which lead you to movements, which lead you to then maybe being in an exhibition and, and things like that. So I think the most important thing is, is sticking to it and, and doing your work. When your head gets in that spiral, when you feel like you're not putting enough content out, do you have tools that you use to take care of yourself? Oh yeah, sometimes it's hard, but I'll it sounds like a punishment, but it's not. I will say like, okay, I have to spend a week or without posting anything or, okay, it seems like I need to spend a weekend, not, you know, just turning off my phone. And mm-hmm. it's very hard. And the, the more time goes on into the future, we, it gets harder and harder to do. It's not getting easier. I'll do that. And it'll help me recenter. Also dreaming, I guess, like, not literally sleeping and dreaming, but going on a walk and letting myself just think about mm-hmm. stuff, you know, kind of for like freely. Yeah, daydreaming. And, yeah, daydreaming. Yeah. It, I think that can help a lot with the uh, artistic creativity and motivation too. Well, that's a way of using your imagination. Like you said, with all of the technology and the screens and all the things, I mean, how often do we really just let our imaginations do what they're supposed to do? That's where our creativity comes from. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's well said because, uh, yeah, today we're just, we're, there's just over stimulation everywhere. There's phones, there's emails, everything. And we, you know, we worry about our families. So we want to make sure we're, we're easily contacted. It's, it's very difficult. So yeah, making time for that. I totally agree. It's, it's important. When I was listening to the multiple podcasts you have done, which I think are all amazing in the different types of your personal story that you tell, one of the things you said was that you have to fight for your femininity. How so? 
Yeah, so growing up, I never felt like I was enough. I grew up, my my mother, she's a, a feminist and she's always expressed to me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, she always expressed to me that she power of femininity and you know feminine power and power of women and things like that so so that was great but at the same time I, I was and she always told me you're so beautiful you're so beautiful and so she was filling up my cup all the time but because I had this this breast that was missing I felt like you're calling me beautiful but you don't really know who I am uh-huh. and so I so therefore I kind of felt like a monster in some way even though you know not anyone's fault and there's also wait what, what was the question again <laughs> fighting for femininity yes so and then that was the other side is like uh, women and femininity and all of this was so important and so powerful I felt like I wasn't enough of that because I only had I was not becoming what I needed to be as having one side that didn't didn't develop women also have small breasts or no breasts or like it's not about that like you know <laughs> I was young. I feel like I've always had to fight for my femininity in that way that I maybe, for example, I have to, I'm going to remove my breasts completely. And there's a fight for me where I need to rediscover and redefine what femininity is for me. And I'm going to do that, you know, when the time comes. And I I feel like I've been doing that my whole life uh, as well. So it's sort of this this fight and and i do think that in that way femininity is something that we channel or maybe it's this spiritual place that we can kind of tap into and it's not in our bodies and by the world always telling us that our bodies are what is valuable yeah. um, that is keeping us trapped and really our power is tapping into that femininity or that that other thing out there I want to quote you because this reminded me of something I wrote down from your Instagram. On one of your posts, you said, what are you afraid of? Some of the most beautiful art is born out of fear. I'm most afraid of letting anyone know me. That post touched me because I have also felt that. Oh, I'm so, I mean, I'm sorry, but I'm also like, I'm, I'm happy that you feel seen too. Yeah. I feel for me very literally, it was, um, I, I built a lot of walls around me because I, I didn't want anyone to know me and, and my secret about my breast growing up. And, and so then I, I even made friends. I didn't realize at the time, but I made friends who were very egocentric or, or maybe not only egocentric, but they just never asked me questions. And they were talking, there were people who talk, 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 because for me, they were safe they were safe people, they would never get to know me. It was only while I got older that I realized, oh, why, why do am I always around these people? And I thought, oh, maybe I attract them. So I decided I need to let people know me and I need to be around people who want to know me mm-hmm. as well. And it is the scariest thing, I think, is Very. Pe- for people to, to know the real you. Mm-hmm. Why, why do you, why did that, if you don't mind me asking, why did that touch you? Well, I have a feeling it is part of the human condition as a whole, but also in my own personal, I feel like I built walls about my, around myself as well. And I'm just working this through with my therapist. Mine was more like a denial of my own needs and just being sort of like the happy, go lucky, don't stir the pot. I don't really have any needs. Whatever you want is fine that kind of thing without the fear of saying, hey, I have some needs and wants to acknowledge me. So it's similar. It's not the exact same story, but I I have a feeling it's the, how about you, Raquel? Do you have that? God, yeah. (laughs) Do I ever? Yeah, because I, I, I was actually thinking about this yesterday. I feel like I'm surrounded by people who have known me for a very long time, but don't really know me, right? I don't know if it's necessarily because they haven't asked or I don't tell, or maybe I try to tell and they don't listen or or they don't retain the information. Do you know what I mean? Where they're trying to put me into their box of what I should be. 
Lala, when you were just speaking about this, about these are the people that you're attracting, like people who just don't ask you, that hit really hard for me because I feel like, yeah, literally knife in the heart um, in a good way (laughs) because make me think because in romantic relationships, that's what I have attracted because they're, you know, it's more of me asking the questions of them and trying to get to know them. And then they don't ask me those questions. They aren't asking me the probing questions, trying to get to know me beyond the surface and I'm not having those deep conversations which is one of the reasons why Jennifer and I started the podcast is so that we could have these conversations because people aren't having them in their real lives so yeah so as far as the walls yeah I mean I've built the walls too I think it's maybe I think it's a it's a two-way street like yes I ask the questions of other people from time to time but then sometimes I just kind of sit back and I don't I don't ask those probing questions because sometimes, I mean, it, if you're just in a big group of people, it doesn't always feel like that's the time to ask those questions, you know, to have those like really deeper conversation. So yeah, so that just, thankfully, Lala, you are learning all this like when you're earlier than Jennifer and I are yeah, learning you. On you. So, so hats off to you. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure I'm still going to be learning a, a bunch, you know, oh, I'm going to continue well, learning <laughs> for sure. Exactly. Well, and that's, that's part of life, right? Is that you continue to learn. If you don't, well, Absolutely. then you're just stagnant. You're just standing still. I do think that it is, it is a two-way street, but at the same time, I, I don't know if it's just me. I, that's why I always ask people too. I'm like, is it just me or do people just not ask questions anymore? Like, yeah. it's not just you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you both a little secret to my online dating. I realized early on that if you treated the date like an interview and had a list of questions for them, they always left the date really liking you. But the truth of it was they just like talking about themselves. I think that, again, I'm going to go back to the human condition. I think we have not learned how to connect with one another to truly connect because in those interviews that I created, it was very rare when anyone asked me a question back. Very rare. And like I told you before, Raquel, I've been on countless, countless, countless dates. I've been practicing this stuff. Mm. In a way, it's like a social experiment. I also think, you know, recently we had a shooting in Michigan, a school Mm. shooting. And when I devastated as a parent and, and, and a human being and but when I really think about it, what is the issue? I think it comes back to I know people are going to get mad at me. I think it comes back to capitalism and really caring about produce, produce, produce. What happens to these kids in school? Like you must achieve, you must do this. You must, their lives are so scheduled now. They Mm -hmm. barely have a moment to breathe. Mm -hmm. And I think what's missing, and, and maybe I'm completely off base, but I'm just throwing this out there, that human beings have not learned to connect and that that kid he needed connection. He needed to connect with another human being or multiple human beings on a human level to ground him to this earth. And my feeling is he didn't have that with anybody or else how do you, how do you do that? I mean, I didn't mean to bring this up, but that's what I think is missing is there's a whole multitude of people who are unwilling to show themselves because of fear, because they don't know how to connect, because they think if they put themselves out there, what they're going to get is bullying and ridicule instead of a deep connection with another human being. And showing yourself is a risk. It totally is. Absolutely. Definitely. And and the sad thing is, though, is like when you do show yourself, it's the th- like usually people accept you, I think. Of course, high school's scary. High school, the middle school is very scary. That's why I kept my secret, obviously, because mm-hmm. kids are very dangerous. They're very scary. With coming back to your your topic about connection, I think it's actually getting, in my opinion, getting worse because of the internet and the way that mm-hmm. we 
interact on the internet. Like we have these public spaces on the internet, like, uh, you know, on Facebook or other forums where it's very performative. You know, people are watching. So there's a lot of ego involved. So you're, you're making sure that what you write is, you know, everyone's going to read this. So you want to be right. You want to, you know, make the other person look wrong. You want to, there's so much ego in it. And Mm -hmm. I think we do it so much and we're not just having conversations anymore in this like non-public sphere. Only presenting what looks good on a picture with a filter with a filter, right with a filter right exactly exactly and always just and also just presenting your opinion all the time instead of asking other people's opinion mm-hmm. it's like a lot of it too i think and and yeah creating your brand of course and all of that that's <laughs> um you know we're people young people are just born into into this machine now mm-hmm. so it's yeah very well, different that's what I, one thing that I really love about your art, Lala, is that you are very vulnerable in your art. You are putting it out there and not just letting your walls down and letting people see you, but I think you're inviting people to think about these things for themselves as well and to put themselves into the space of your art and and that's the point of art right or one point of art is to put people in a different headspace so that they can consider something else in yeah. a different point thank you for saying that i think that's my that would be my my biggest goal with the art is to try to to do that to have somebody step in for a moment into another universe or another perspective or and see how they feel there and I'm really happy if, if you feel like that's being communicated. I also think that's why it's scary for some people too, sometimes. Yeah, and we, we run away from things that are scary. But mm-hmm. I think the, the way that you put your art out there, you're, you're showing that it's okay to stand in that fear and to put that fear out there for other people to witness and to, for people to witness you processing that fear. Yeah, exactly. I feel that that way too, that it's I'm definitely a work in progress. And yeah, it does, it does take a lot of vulnerability to show the process of that, the, to show I'm not even, you know, finished with this whole breast journey and one day I will, but I'm, I'm letting, letting people in and it is really scary, but I think you get used to it too, to be honest with you. I, it was really scary. It was the first time I came out about it. And then I, I was scared a few other times, but now I think I've done it enough that nothing scares me. (laughs) I'll talk about what I want to. And, you know, if I make mistakes, I'm human and I'll apologize, but I'm not going to censor myself before speaking and we're all learning. And I think we all need to speak as much as possible and give our point of views and add to the conversation Mm -hmm. as much as possible because there's nobody like us in the world. Yeah. So your art is helping you become a better version of you and it's helping you be kinder to yourself definitely into the world Mm -hmm. that's a big one too because whether we like it or not we're not perfect and we have bias when you can see a reflection of that bias by your creations or your art it can help you also get over that as well nice Is there anything that you wanted to talk about on this podcast to get out to our small but powerful group of listeners that we didn't ask you about? No, I feel like these conversations were were really great. It was, it it went all kinds of places and I I learned a little bit about both of you as well. And so it was, it was really beautiful. What's on the horizon for you? I mean, I know you're, you talked about having your next surgery and processing that through your art. What else do you see on the on the horizon? Uh, so right now I'm making a documentary on the the full. Um, it's called uh, it's called La Ladrona, a Gen- a Genesis, mm-hmm. and so it's about my breast experience and how that has influenced my art. And it goes through the the surgeries as well. We're we're filming the surgeries and everything. So oh, wow. It's going to be quite complete, but it's going to take maybe two more years before that gets released. So that's, that's the big project I'm working on. And then smaller, but also kind of a big project is I'm creating a a fiction podcast that takes place in my fictional universe. And Mm -hmm. 
I'm still halfway finished. I want to write everything first and then release it. It's called The Lamb, like L-L-A-M, but Mm -hmm. maybe in another year as well. And besides that, yeah, I've created a, a Facebook group. So if anyone out there has met anybody with the unilateral breast agenesis it's called I think the the group on Facebook is called unilateral breast agenesis or and so I'm looking for just one person would be great to meet because I know they exist out there and Mm -hmm. I consider us to be born Amazons so because that's (laughs) a great way to look at that I love that (laughs) thank you I actually I didn't think of it until like maybe a year ago when I heard some there's this this artist uh, Prunuri. She 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 had breast cancer, and and so she she considered herself and also other women with breast cancer as Amazons, you know. And I thought, oh, I'm a born Amazon. That's amazing. That's so strong. And so, I'm inviting if anyone has unilateral breast agenesis, so uh, yeah, contact me and we can talk. And it's always nice to see somebody else who who's been through it. You have so much you have in the works. I am so excited to see everything come to fruition. And so please keep us posted and let us know how things are going with all that. Let us know when the finished products are available and what we can do to help get the word out about your projects and and your documentary and and all this. I just, everybody needs to know about this and we wanna do our part in helping to get your art out into the world. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll just, I don't know if any, if you put the, the sh- in the show notes and stuff, but yeah, it, people can also keep track of my, my projects on my Instagram <laughs> after speaking yeah. about. <laughs> we'll put all of that in the show notes for sure. Oh, this was amazing. Lala. thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I love talking to you today and I feel really inspired to share your story with my young women and especially about the focus of art for the joy in itself and not necessarily to become a superstar or to make money or, and I know that's everybody's end game, but I just would hate to see them lose their joy of the art. It's, it's a delicate thing too, where I, artists were special people. I think we're special creatures and not always the easiest people, but I think it's important to, you know, protect that part of yourself. We do. We need all of you. We need all of the artists and the creators in the world. So thank you for the work that you do and the work that you share with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Oh, Raquel, she hands down amazing. amazing. She's amazing. I am so impressed with her and her, her her willingness to actually process and, and feel what needs to be felt to allow herself the space to to do all of this and then to share it with other people that other people can be touched by it that's so very brave yeah and yeah. i would like to get a a i don't I, I don't even know how you purchase her art but i would like to get a big print of the void yes for my home i think that's inspiring to me cuz what i realized is that void in all of us is that piece mm-hmm. that we try to fill some people do it with art Maybe you and I do it with our conversation and our writing. Some people, maybe they do go to church and they find it that way. I think maybe you found it in diving when you talk about diving. I think oh, maybe I did. Exactly. I, that void, that is now my new, probably favorite subject. That was amazing. Yeah, that was, that was great. I love that we get to have conversations with amazing people and share them. My favorite part of what we do. Thanks, Raquel. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone for listening today. We will be back with more Madness Cafe next week. You can find us on Instagram at Madness Cafe Podcast or email us at madnesscafepodcast at gmail.com. Bye.